for me, the Mark VI Golf R is the second least attractive of all of the Golf R models. The other manufacturers, can you please take note? Now it is a Volkswagen, let's not fool ourselves. There is plenty to go wrong. It actually feels a little bit unhinged. It's a bit like an accountant that does kickboxing to keep fit. Okay, surely the Mark VI Volkswagen Golf R, this thing must be one of the best bang for your buck performance cars available on the used market right now. But are they? Like, how are they aging? What do they like to live with and drive? Should you ever seriously consider buying one? Critically, what goes wrong with them? Tell you what, we're gonna answer all of those questions and so many more, but first we do need to talk competition. First of all, these are asking anywhere from $15,000 to $35,000 here on the Aussie used car market. But in that price range, in this genre of car, you have some options. If you want some hints of luxury and all drive and turbocharged weapons, you've got the sibling and twin under the skin Audi S3. You've also got the AMG CLA 45, which happens to be a bit more powerful than the Golf R. If you're happy to sacrifice some of the premium feels for Rally Inspired Dynamics, you've got the Ford Focus RS and various Lancer Evo 10, Subaru WRX and STI models. If you're happy with a car that just spins up the rear wheels and you also need a hint of luxury and the option of auto and manual transmissions, you've got the BMW M135i. And then as far as front wheel drive options go, from Europe you've got the Renault Megane RS models, Alfa Romeo Giuliettas, Ford Focus STs, even the sibling to this car, the Mark 6 and even Mark 7 Golf GTI. From Japan you've got the Mazda 3 MPS or the Mazda Speed 3 for our international viewers, not to mention older EP3 and FD2 Civic Type Rs. And even from South Korea, Hyundai's i30N has developed something of a cult-like following and with good reason, it's amazing. And we've reviewed pretty much all of those cars and the links are all down there. But now the bare basics about these, depending on your market, you can get them as a five door or a three door body shell. Engine wise, it's gonna be a two liter four cylinder turbo. All R's are all wheel drive, although it is a Haldex system, so ostensibly, it's front wheel drive until the front lose traction, and then it sends a bit of power to the rear. And you'll have a choice of dual clutch automatic or six speed manual transmissions. The R is the range topping golf, so you're gonna get all of the bells and whistles. You know what other link is down there? It's the link to driver, and they're gonna get you the very best possible finance deal. Look, I'm not gonna bore you with all of the details now, but just know driver exists to get you the very best possible finance deals as quickly and as easily as possible. And if you do secure your finance via that link, we're gonna give you 150 bucks with the free fuel. Did you know the Mark VI Golf R was technically the first turbocharged Golf R model? The Mark V R, which is called the R32, was actually powered by a naturally aspirated 3.2 litre 6. Now, are you ready for a, let's say, controversial opinion? For me, the Mark VI Golf R is the second least attractive of all of the Golf R models. Calm down, calm down. That's a bit like saying it's the second least attractive Hemsworth brother. So I'm not saying it's ugly. It's just, for me, it's, it's not a standout. See, for me, the Mark V R32 is an absolute classic. Walter De Silva got the design right from the start. The Mark 7 and 7.5, both excellent, all angular and aggressive. The Mark 8 does nothing for me at all. It is the worst of the lot. It looks like a sleepy, grumpy cat. And the Mark 6, again, like I just said, it's not ugly, but isn't it just a bit, a bit too conservative, just a bit too sensible? Obviously, lowering it a little bit and putting some really classy rims on it can fix all of that. But for me, the Mark 6 is it's the facelift to the Mark 5 that it never really needed. It's a bit like if Margot Robbie or Ryan Gosling went and got Michael Jackson levels of plastic surgery, just not needed. But while we're talking about exterior mistakes, let's talk about what goes wrong with the exterior, starting with the little plastic clips that hold on the corners of the bumpers here. According to owners, these little plastic clips are becoming brittle with age and they can snap and break and then the, the whole front bar kind of sticks out a bit. Then there are reports of electronic gremlins. Anything that's powered by electricity, especially the power folding mirrors, they they can work erratically. Not a common problem, but it does happen. Apparently the drainage holes in the doors can get clogged up and fill with water. So if you open and close the door and you hear sloshing, not a great sign. Okay, this is a concerning one. Apparently the sound deadening foam or sponge that is up in the wheel arches, it can get wet and retains water and eventually it can create rust. Some owners even stated that the first thing they did was to remove the inner wings to sort this sponge issue out. Now, if you're located in a cold climate with salted roads or you live on or next to the beach, there are some rust issues with the tailgate. Apparently around the, the rear badge and around the rear tail lights, it can be a bit of an issue. Not a big problem if you don't live in those locations. Though. And this one isn't Volkswagen or the car's fault at all, but because these are getting more affordable and they respond so incredibly well to performance tuning, 
make sure you go over the entire car and look for any accident damage or even worse, dodgy repair work. Actually, you know what? Go and watch our ultimate used car buyer's guide. The link's down there. It could save you thousands and it will help you identify what to look out for. Did you know the Mark VI Golf R was something of a manufacturing triumph for Volkswagen? They made more profit per car sold on these than the industry standard for cars in this category. Now, problems and issues inside, just like an old Ford Falcon, the headlining in these can sag like an old parachute. Also, like the exterior, there are quite a few reports of weird electrical gremlins, so you just make sure you push every button, make sure everything works. Now, loads of owners have complained that the interior plastics can get brittle with age, and that results and the entire interior rattling. Also, a few owners have complained about water ingress issues. The water can apparently come in through the speaker seals, the window regulator card seals, and through the taillights into the boot. Also into the rear footwells. Basically, if you're looking at one of these, it's gonna be gross, but touch the footwells and see if it feels damp. If it feels damp, not a good sign. Also, if it has a sunroof, Make sure those drainage channels are cleared. This is critical because water will make its way inside if they're not cleared and it can play havoc with the electronics. Totally stuff up your ECU, major nightmare. But other than that, it's all pretty much positives in here, especially the driving position in these seats. Actually, other manufacturers, can you please take note, in a performance car, this is the height that we want to be able to get the seats. Far too many performance cars in this category, you sit far too high, in this, they're just brilliant, brilliant positioning, typical for Volkswagen. Also, the seats themselves, it's like the whole car. It's like the perfect balance between performance and classy and sophisticated. Super supportive, but never uncomfortable on a long trip. Just brilliant. Actually, for me, the entire interior is just bloody lovely. A few people have complained or mentioned that it's starting to feel a little bit cheap and nasty these days, and it's really feeling its age. Okay, from a design perspective, it's a bit on the conservative side. This aftermarket Alpine head unit or screen really makes it feel far more current than it actually is, but even without this, it, they're not too bad. Actually, just on this aftermarket Alpine screen, even though the Mark VI, it missed out on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto from new, one of the big advantages of these cars is just how interchangeable some of the tech is with more recent Golf models. See, apparently it's really easy to retrofit newer OEM infotainment systems. This means Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, better phone connectivity, plus a better reversing camera. Even the climate control, you can swap this out for more recent digital climate control clusters. But besides that, you're still going to get an excellent sounding eight speaker stereo. You're going to get dual zone climate control, USB input, power, everything, and all of this and more. Not to mention there were a whole bunch of lovely optional extras available as well, like 19 inch rims, extra leather everywhere and sat nav although that sat nav these days it completely sucks now just on bluetooth this seems to be a bit of a mystery some owners claim that they had bluetooth as standard others say it doesn't have it do you have Bluetooth in yours? What's the story here? Now, as far as the all-important safety features go, first of all, it is all-wheel drive, so from a physics point of view, you're already sort of winning the battle there. But to take you through the safety features that you can expect, it seems only right that we cut to a voiceover that is done in a, a scenario that many Golf R owners find themselves, which is driving like a dickhead. Okay, so you can expect seven airbags, ABS, brake assist, electronic brake force distribution, traction control, and electronic stability control. But forget about autonomous safety tech because the Mark VI is obviously way too old for that stuff. Now, if you do need all of the specific details of features and tech and all that sort of stuff, maybe even the ultimate used Golf R buyer's guide, go to redriven.com and check out the completely free cheat sheet. It will answer all of your questions and so much more. Now, another thing a few owners mentioned was that they don't feel that these interiors are quite as resilient as some of the cars from the competition. In this particular car, look, this is used on a daily basis. It's got over 160,000 Ks on it. It is this owner's family car and wear and tears Okay, so some of the leather has lost its texture a little bit and also the leather on the seats, it's getting just a little bit loose here and there and also there's a bit of wear on the leather around here but I think that's to be expected. The plastics and the door cards, it feels fine and would come up nicely with a bit of a detail. Carpets are okay, it's alright, switch gear, it feels good. It's, not, it's kind of how you'd expect the wear and tear to be for a car with this many kilometres of this age. And also, it might be a performance car but it's a Golf, it needs to be practical. Is it? Let's find out. First of all, pretty good size glove box there. Spot, really nicely designed for your phone just here. And there's actually another little cubby hole underneath there. 
I say, I say well designed for your phone, because of the acceleration in this, your phone will slide around. You've got two cup holders here with the adjustable little slidey section there. But what's interesting, it's got, I'm pretty sure this is a bottle opener. Is this a standard fitment thing? Very cool, I hope it is, well done. Uh, cubby hole here. You've got really good sized door bins which are carpet lined so that'll keep your cold drinks nice and warm. There's another little cubby hole here and there's nothing specific for storage under the seats and there is a spot for your sunglasses and what does Pete wear? He wears Ray-Bans. Okay, in the back seat, I'm exactly five centimetres taller than Australian delivered Golf R Adam Scott. This is in my driving position, and it's not too bad. Okay, the knees rubbing up against the back of the seat here, not a stack of footroom, but the seat is so comfortable, even a little bit supportive. I mean, how dark it all feels, I feel like I'm being being hugged by the car. Now, as far as wear and tear back here, especially considering the amount of work this gets as a family car, Pretty good, leather's wearing really nicely. It's a little bit on the firm side, just a smidge. The door cards are good, just like the front. A few marks in the backs of the seats, that's to be expected. Pretty good for wear and tear. Obviously, every Golf R interior is gonna be different with wear and tear, but yeah, in this example, not too bad. And then as far as practicality in the back seats, you get two map pockets, you get your own air vents here, you get a specific pacifier or dummy holder just here with little claws to trap the kids' fingers in. You've got a pull down armrest here. This actually opens up so if the kids are being bad, you just shove them into the boot and close this and forget you ever had them in the first place. And look, it does have door bins, but actually getting to them, kind of got to go under your leg, but yeah, that's a bit of a nightmare, but it has door bins, they're just a bit shit. As far as practicality in the boot goes, it's a Volkswagen Golf. It's pretty much the industry standard for practicality in the boot. Plus, with the seats down, great amount of space. And they fold kind of flat. Now, before we get into the driving impressions of what these are like, now they're 10 years old, I have a bit of a history with this car. See, this is owned by one of my very best mates, Pete. Pete, thank you so much for lending me your car again. Bloody love you, mate. Also, a massive thank you to all the members of the Mark VI, Golf R uh, owners groups and forums. You guys are amazing, thank you so much. We really, we couldn't have made this video without you. Also, if you happen to own a cool car that you'd like to see us feature on Redriven, can you let us know in the comments or message us on the socials because we're always on the hunt for cool cars. Now, if you're in the market for one of these, you've probably noticed that for the, the same price as a mint condition Mark VI, you can get a slightly less good condition high kilometer Mark VII Golf R. But for me, from a driving perspective, I actually prefer the Mark 6 over the Mark 7. The Mark 7, it feels all grown up and more refined, and that's fine if you're a real estate agent and you're driving clients around to buy another investment property. But at less than 7 tenths, the Mark 7 Golf R just feels like every other Golf. But this thing, see, Volkswagen hadn't quite sorted out all the NVH levels with this, so it feels, I think, a bit more raw, more tactile. It actually feels a little bit unhinged. It's a bit like, an accountant that does kickboxing to keep fit. However, the problem with this is that a few owners have complained that these things can rattle like a cutlery drawer in an earthquake after a few years. In this particular one, there are the odd little sporadic rattles here and there, but not too bad. Although, I have another friend that has one of these, and yeah, it's like a maraca on wheels. And if you love a Mark VI Golf R, you're gonna hate what I'm about to say. A Mark VI Golf GTI is just more fun more of the time. Sure, it's not as fast off the line, it's not as fast out of a corner, it's probably not as fast really anywhere, but it is just more fun. But in saying that, speaking of fun, you know what is fun? This thing with a manual transmission, it doesn't completely transform the car, but just having this involvement and engagement is just so rewarding. Again, this is not as fast as a DSG, but who cares? And if you need a DSG to drive in traffic or you don't know how to drive a manual, well either learn how to drive a manual or toughen up or both. Now things to check out when you're test driving one of these, it's really important to remember that plenty of these have been modified, modified poorly, modified poorly then returned back to stock to sell or just abused from day one. First of all, through corners like this, yeah, it should just stick like glue. If at normal road speeds it feels unbalanced or it's wandering all over the place, that's not a good sign. 
If you're starting to sense a load of understeer on public roads, that's a really good sign that you're actually driving like a complete dickhead. Leave that kind of driving for the racetrack, which is where you'll find out that these do understeer while eating their front brakes and front tires. Also, these things, they do have a habit of eating through their front lower control arm bushes, so listen for any clunking or weird suspension sounds. Also, speaking of things that are clunky, these DSG transmissions, they do have a habit of being a bit confused on occasion at normal road speeds. If it's like me, which is confused all of the time, that's not a good sign. Also, the immense power should come on really smoothly. If it's bucking or losing power through the rev range, again, not a good sign. Also, if the steering feels a bit dead and lifeless, don't stress, that's just a Volkswagen thing. They really should talk to Honda or Hyundai on how to calibrate steering. Also, another issue that these suffer from, actually a lot of other cars suffer from, is just exorbitant prices for OEM wiper blades. To solve this, hit the wiper tech link down below to get 15% off and free express shipping on some of the best wiper blades we've ever used. But look, while we're talking about potential issues with these things, mechanically, what goes wrong with them? I'm afraid I can't tell you because I'm not a qualified mechanic, but Jim is. Now, a fun fact about these, they have the EA113 engine, which has a timing belt. Unlike the EA888, engine, which is in nearly every other Volkswagen, which has a timing chain. Now the belts in these are due at 105,000 Ks for every seven years. Whereas the timing chain in the EA888 often doesn't last as long as the belt. Now another fun fact, the EA113 has this water pump, unlike the EA888 that has this abomination. Let's just compare the two, shall we? 50 bucks versus 1,000 bucks. This one can last up to 100,000 Ks. This one really lasts past 50. Now it is a Volkswagen, let's not fool ourselves, there is plenty to go wrong. A pretty common problem with these is the high pressure fuel pump or the cam follower that actuates it. It does wear prematurely. Now sometimes as it wears, um, it just logs a fuel pressure fault code. Sometimes it doesn't give you any clues and it can just have a catastrophic failure. Thankfully, it's actually quite easy to pull out and check and only takes about 20 minutes to change. So it's well worthwhile just doing that as a service item. Now the turbos on these will more so the diverter valve on them. Look, there's just a seal in there that fails and you just get a whole bunch of uh, boost regulation uh, fault codes. Again, it's actually pretty easy to change too. Now another common problem, it's just a Volkswagen thing, uh, the PCV valve on these things, there's a diaphragm in there, it just ruptures and causes a bunch of lean fault codes and sometimes a misfire as well. Uh, and sometimes you can hear the thing sucking as well. Again, weirdly, uh, it's actually quite cheap and easy to change too. Now something not so quick and easy to change is the oil consumption issues. These are known for it. So if you have one, just keep an eye on the oil level and top it up frequently. This car, the one in our video, actually had a catastrophic engine failure, which was linked to oil supply issues. Now, thankfully, Volkswagen actually covered that under warranty, despite it being out of warranty. So yeah, surprising. And before the Volkswagen fanboys tear us a new one, that car actually did have a flawless service history. Now the transmissions. Look, we'll start with the manual. Actually not too bad. Um, you're more likely to have an issue with the dual mass flywheel failing before the clutch does. And most of the gearbox issues that we've seen in these can often be connected to operator technique. Now the DSG, the DQ250, it is actually more reliable than the seven speed, although it's not really saying much though, is it? Yes, they're jerky. Yes, they're clunky, but that doesn't actually mean that there's something wrong with it. If there is something wrong with it, you'll probably notice weird shifting or not shifting at all. You might hear some strange noises and you might feel some unpleasant vibrations and you're more than likely going to see some warning lights or you might experience all of the above. They have accumulator issues, but there's upgrade kits for that. They have mechatronics uh, complications as well. They have clutch issues and they have internal electronics problems as well. So they definitely do have their fair share of issues. Yes, servicing helps, which is an absolute must, but we've seen all of those problems happen on units that have been well serviced too. And again, like the manuals, some of the issues we see on these are attributed to operator technique as well. If you thrash the f out of it, it will break. Now, further down the drive line, the Haldex system in these can be somewhat problematic, um, less problematic if it's been serviced though. And servicing on these is often overlooked. And in fact, dealerships will tell you that they're filled for life and don't need servicing, they do. It's recommended every three years or 40,000 Ks, but I would halve that if you're doing any track work. Servicing these is actually pretty simple and pretty cheap too. There's a bunch of service kits available and those service kits do have the filter that Volkswagen tells you doesn't exist. Pretty straightforward. Another thing we have seen a few of is the rubber drive coupling in the tail shaft. 
We have seen a few of them fail, but not what I call a common problem. Realistically, one of the biggest issues you're going to see with these car are the dickhead owners. Not saying they're all dickheads, but some of them are just treated poorly, and some of them have terrible mods too, which can cause all sorts of problems. Again, we say this all the time, if you're looking at buying one, try and buy one with a flawless service history that has not been modified. And if it has been modified, just try to make sure those mods have been done well by a reputable workshop. So look, after all of that, for us to recommend buying one of these, it really comes down to what sort of driving lifestyle you want. If you want the maximum acceleration for the minimal purchase price, a car that will easily dominate a corner no matter what the scenario is wrapped in something relatively classy and understated, and you've found a perfectly maintained example, sure a Mark VI Golf R might be worth considering. However, if you want a car that requires nuance and skill to get the most out of it, a car that prioritises driver engagement over sheer speed, a car that demands time to learn its idiosyncrasies, sorry, but we're not sure if a Golf R is the car for you. Look, this might sound ridiculous, but, and ignoring any reliability concerns, these things are so bloody brilliant at everything, they risk being a bit boring. Not as boring as a Mark 7 or 7.5 Golf R, but yeah, you get the idea. But that's not something that we can say about this car. But a question for you, if you were to buy that or one of these, which of the other plethora of examples of performance cars in this budget would you buy? Let us know in the comments below. See you next time. Another problem. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, but just know that driver exists to you. Uh, 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 no.